Good day all, or to all my viewers online and my viewers here present. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kenge Agabo. I have uh, an important discussion this afternoon, and uh, the topic for our discussion is uh, synopsis of environmental laws and guidelines in Nigeria. <clears throat> so the outline of our discussion is as follows. We're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to introduce the topic, the function of environmental law, the synopsis, regulators, the AI Act, and thereafter talk about uh, the guidelines and standards, and finally, the conclusion. <clears throat> For introduction, we know that uh, over the years we've had uh, <clears throat> situations whereby we have uh, investors coming into the country to do investments and they set up many developmental projects. And we have seen that in the bid to have the economic gain, the economy and the environment has suffered great loss. So in a way to curb some of these activities and try to strike a dynamic balance between economic growth and our uh, sustainable environment, the need for environmental law is necessary. And if we're looking at environmental law as a whole, the concept of environmental law is very broad, especially in our country, Nigeria. And uh, the best we can do for now is to pick up some few summary of what the environmental law and guideline in Nigeria is all about. Uh, for our introduction, the FEPA Act of the Federal Republic of Nigeria tries to define the environment as uh, water, air, land, all plants, and human beings and animals living here. And uh, not to forget also that uh, there is a striking relationship between each of these components of the environment. And none of these components of this environment stands alone on its own. There is a balance between them, and that balance needs to be sustained. Uh, after that, we're going to look at uh, the other technology we need to look at briefly, and that's the main topic of discussion today, is the environmental law. But specifically, we are looking at the Nigerian environmental law. And what, what is it all about? Now, the, legis the environmental law covers legislations, regulations, guidelines, and standards adopted to control activities with potential damaging effects on the country's environment. And I want you to note this. The key point in this uh, definition is the, term, the word control, control activities. That means without an environmental law in place, there is going to be disorderliness in the system. So environmental laws have been formulated to deal with varieties of environmental pollutants, such as noise, toxic chemicals, etc., etc., and uh, provide general guidelines for protecting basic social resources, such as the air, land, and water. And uh, having said that, we've done, some, we've done the, the introduction of this terminology. The next question that I believe you have in your mind is, uh, what are the functions of this environmental law? Why do we, have, why do we need to have an environmental law in place? I want us to know that uh, it is very important for accountability. Now, in a system where there is no law in place, there tends not to be accountability, and there tends to be disorderliness. And that is why Environmental law, the introduction of environmental law in Nigeria has gone a long way to see how the environment is sustained. And now let's see some of the basic functions of uh, the environmental laws at work here in Nigeria. The first one is that uh, this environmental law sets offenses and uh, penalties for causing harm to the environment, which is not authorized. So every harm and every harm done to the environment, there is an offense there is a penalty allotted to it. And apart from that also, environmental law will help you to assess, control, or stop certain activity, especially before they commence. Then set policies and standards for how activities will be controlled and how environmental decisions and uh, approval will be made. And also environmental law will help to enable each member of the public to take part in environmental decision making. And that is good news. The environmental law makes it, makes it possible for every one of us to be stakeholders in environment. 
stakeholders in decision making and things that is related to our environment. So, and apart from that, finally, also it creates regulatory structures for environmental management, such as regulatory agencies. So, in the course of our discussion, we are going to highlight some of these regulatory agencies we are talking about. Synopsis for international guidance, guidelines, and uh, convention. Our main focus is the synopsis of uh, the national uh, environmental law. But uh, I believe it's important also we look at it in the broad sense of it. Let us just first introduce a few uh, guidelines and conventions that we have at the world level. The first one is the World Bank Group Environmental Health and Safety Guideline. And uh, the second one is the Equator Principle the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, United Nations Convention on Climate Change, Convention to Regulate International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora, Convention on Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. So these are some of the conventions in place on, at the international level. And having said that, I want us to look at what we have in place what is the local content? What we have in place in Nigeria? And uh, here are some of them. Now, if we look at uh, the national environmental law within Nigeria, first let us understand that the basic environmental policy in Nigeria is contained in the law of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, that is post one to section 20 of the constitution of this great nation. And if we examine the environmental law here in Nigeria, you will observe that uh, there are divided basically into four. And we have uh, the framework environmental legislation, we have the sectorial legislation, we have the incidental legislation, and then finally we have the laws derived, derived from international laws. And now first, let us look at uh, what, we, what we're talking about when we're talking about the framework legislation. So I want us to know that this framework uh, legislation is a single law which contains a comprehensive system of law for environmental management. So it is important to know that these laws that form the framework are the key, are the key laws and guidelines for this very nation, Nigeria. And we have a, we have a whole lot of them, uh, but uh, I have listed out here a few of them. The key one amidst this law is. Uh, the Environmental Impact uh, Assessment Act that is contained in uh, Chapter 12 under the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 2004. The National Environmental Standard and Regulation Enforcement Agency, NESRA Act, 2007. Armful Waste Degree, a Special Criminal Provision Act, that is uh, Chapter 165 of the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1990. Public Health Law, that is Chapter 109 of 1963. And then we also have the Nigeria Criminal Code Act, that is Chapter 77, Section 243 to 248, laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 2004. Now, I'm talking about the sectorial legislation that we have in this country. Uh, we have some legislations that are very, very precise. They are sectorial, they are very, very precise, they are not general. Uh, the first one is uh, the Mineral Act of 1956. It's specifically for the mining industry. We have, for, we have Oil Pipeline Act of 1958. We have oil in navigable waters at 1968. We have our petroleum at of 1969. We have the refiner at the factory at 1987. So all of these are the sectorial legislations that are, are available in, in a local context in Nigeria. So this act address specific aspects of the environment and human activities especially here in Nigeria. Uh, the next, we have uh, the incidental legislation. These laws are not specifically intended to address environmental issues, but uh, do contain some elements that have impact 
on environmental issues. They are incidental because uh, the purpose of setting up these very hats was not really directed towards the environment. But in setting up of the hats, certain aspect of these hats has to do with uh, environmental issues. So we call them the incidental legislation. And part of it is the public health hat of uh, 1917, the criminal code 1916, chapter 77, laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1990. And finally, in the Sino 6 of uh, the national environmental laws available within this country, we have laws that are derived from international laws. These are borrowed laws. They are derived from international laws. And an example of it is a uh, oil, mineral oil safety regulation act, 1963. And uh, these are acts that uh, Nigeria is signatory to a number of international laws. Nigeria is signatory to a number of international laws, and these are the example of it. We have the Petroleum Act of 1968, the Oil in Navigable Waters of Act of 1968. Now, you may be wondering why is it that some of these acts are appearing twice? You know, it depends on their application. Some of them are derived, <coughs> borrowed internationally, but yet sectorially they fit in. So that is why you can see that they are appearing twice. So having said that, we're going to look at uh, who are those responsible for regulating the environmental laws and guidelines? Who are those responsible? Uh, outside Nigeria, we have the World Bank. We have the African Development Bank. Then within our country, Nigeria, we have the Federal Ministry of Environment, National Environmental Standard and the Regulation Enforcement Agency, that is NESRA. Petroleum, the Department of Petroleum Resources, DPRO, NOSRAC, MMSD, and all the relevant government ministries. Oh, for our discussion today, I said, like I said earlier, the concept of environmental law is very broad. It's broad. And uh, what I've done this very moment is to see how I will narrow it down. So I decided to pick one of the framework legislation, and that is uh, the Environmental Impact Assessment Bill, <coughs> 86 of 1992. So this is a principal legislation which made uh, EIA mandatory for both public, private sectors for all developments or capital projects. What is the goal of this degree? What are the goals of this degree? Before anybody or authorities decide to undertake, undertake any projects or activities, each of these activities and projects will, have, will be put into consideration. And putting it into consideration is to see the effects of this proposed activity or projects on the environment. The second goal is to promote the implementation of appropriate procedures to the realization of the above goal. And then the third one is to seek the encouragement of the development of a reciprocal procedure for notification, information, exchange, and the consultation in activities, likely to have a trans-state or transboundary environmental effects. So here are some of the mandatory lists. So when I say mandatory lists, I'm talking about uh, projects that would require the EIA being carried out. Uh, if you know very well in the EIA process, all of these projects that is presented before the regulators would have to pass through the screening process. It is during that screening process that it's going to be determined if a particular project, if a particular project, the EIA is mandatory for a particular project or not. And that means the list of projects that uh, are mandatory for the EIA we can have them, I have them here displayed. We have projects that are related to agriculture. We have a projects, airport projects. We have industrial projects. We have mining projects. We have the whole lot of them. The railway is there. The water supply is there. Power generation and transmission. All of all these, all of all these have the mandate, they have the mandate for AI. They have mandatory study. There is a mandate to study them for EIA, sorry, 
Okay, now talking about uh, the EIA, uh, I believe it's good for us to have a very brief understanding of what is the purpose of this uh, EIA. Why is the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria so particular about this act? Why have they decided to set up this EIA? The first thing is to promote sustainable development by identifying environmentally sound practices and mitigation measures for development to ensure that environmental consequences are taken into account during planning, designing, and decision-making processes. That is the purpose of the Act, the EIA Act. Another purpose of the EIA Act is to influence how it is uh, subsequently managed during its implementation. And finally, to ensure adverse impacts could be reduced or avoided. So this is the key purpose why the EIA Act is set up in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But we're going to look at uh, some of the benefits, like I've listed earlier. Uh, the first part of the benefits is the potential screening out environmentally unsound projects. You have a project, you have a developmental activities that uh, in the economic sense of it, you make a whole lot of money out of it. But uh, the, the regulators will have to sit down and look at it and try to strike a balance to see if there is a balance between environmental sustainability and then the economic gain that is to be made out of it. So at this very point, the EIA will screen out the project even before it starts, and that will save a whole lot of uh, environmental issues. The purpose also to modify design to reduce environmental impacts. Modify designs to reduce environmental impacts. Identify visible alternatives. Predict significant adverse impacts. Identify mitigations. Reduce measure to reduce offset or eliminate major impacts. Offset or eliminate major impacts. Engage and inform potential <coughs> affected community individuals. So the EIA process, the EIA acts, made it in such a way that uh, the community, the affected community, needs to be carried along at all times. So these are some of the benefits that is associated with the, the EIA acts. It influences decision making and the development of terms and conditions. Development of terms and conditions. And uh, if I'm to go further to look at uh, this uh, environmental impact assessment degree hat of, of 1992, uh, I want us to know that this hat is divided into three parts. It's divided into three parts. Uh, the first part, the part one of this very hat, is titled General Principles of Environmental Impact Assessment. Now, this very first part captures the general principles that are involved in environmental impact assessments. And all of these principles captured are 13 in number. Uh, for the sake of time, we will not really be able to see each of these sections of the hat. So what we're going to do is uh, we're limiting our attention and focus to one or two sections of the hat in each of these parts. For part one, I've uh, decided to, you know, decided to outline section four on that part one. Now, what is section four on that part one in the EIA Act say? It says, an environmental impact assessment shall include at least the following minimum matter. That is, the assessment should, what, should have a very good description of the purpose of the activity. And that is why when an investor is coming in, the Federal Ministry of Environment will be very, very interested in knowing, in having a description, a very good description of the proposed activity. And that would involve knowing the kinds of machine they will use, the capacity of the machine they will use, and you know some of these other technical details. Because in the process of getting these details, it will help you to have a clearer view of the nature of the nature of impacts, the nature of environmental impacts that you would expect. The second part of this, the subsection B describes the potential affected environments, including specific information necessary to identify and assess the environmental effects 
of the proposed activity. It also describes a description, it is a description of the practical activities as appropriate. The assessment of this likely and potential environmental impact on the proposed activity and the alternatives, all of these are put into consideration. And also, furthermore, there is the direct and indirect cumulative short term and long term effects. And if we are looking at this, the Federal Ministry of Environment operating this as the AIA Act would require you also to put into consideration some of these direct cumulative impacts that can be associated with the project. And if we're talking about some of these direct cumulative impacts, it can be probably you have a, an industry dis discharging directly efforts into the surface water body. That is a direct uh, cumulative impact. And it, can, it will also require you to look at what are the likely indirect cumulative impacts that are to be associated with these projects. For instance, there is a stack you are in a uh, uh, you are within a power plant uh, facility, and there is this uh, emission of the uh, sulfur oxide. And at the end of the day, sulfur oxide precipitates on the ground, settles on the ground, and causes the soil to be acidic. It's indirect, why? Because they still have some. It's not directly connected to it. We have some short-term and then long-term effects. So this section, section four of the DI Act, requires that all of this must be put into consideration. Uh, going further, under part one, still under this part one of uh, the DSI Act, we still have that uh, there is need also to mention and description of measures available to mitigate adverse environmental impacts of the proposed activity and assessment of those measures. Regulators will demand this. Why? Because this is what is stated in the law. An indication of whether the environment or any other states, local governments, or areas outside Nigeria is likely to be affected by these proposed activities and its alternative. All of these details are required by the EI Act. Now, let us look at uh, the part two of the EIA Act. We just finished talking about the part one. The part two of the EIA Act is titled Environmental Impact Assessment of the Projects. Now, this part two has uh, 27 sections. 27 sections. Now, for the purpose of this uh, discussion today, I have decided to highlight section 25. Now, Subsection under section 25, subsection 1 of section 25 states after receiving a mandatory study report respect of a project, the agency that should be the Federal Ministry of Environment, in any manner it considers appropriate, publish in a notice setting out the following information. So that is the public display before we know the panel review exercise for each of the, the projects carried out. The laws that we make the laws stated the requirements. The law is saying that the dates on, on which the mandatory study reports shall be available to the public, that should be stated. That dates. Everybody should be aware of the dates. The place at which the copies of the reports may be obtained. That should be made available to the general public as required under the section 25 of the EI Act. The deadline and address for the filing comments on the conclusion and recommendation of the report. That is, after this report has been displayed publicly, there should be a deadline and this should be made known to the general community. Still under part two of the EI Act, and still under section 25. But well, now we are looking at subsection 2. Prior to the deadline set out in the notice published by the agency, any person may file comments with the agency relating to the conclusion and recommendation of the mandatory study report. This empowers every one of us to be stakeholders. The EI Act at this point empowers each and every one of us to be stakeholders. So if you have a project within around your community, automatically you are a stakeholder. 
and you are a stakeholder because this section of the law empowers you to be. And uh, the final part, that is in part three of the EI Act, is titled the miscellaneous. Uh, it has uh, five sections underneath it. Uh, I'm picking the uh, section 62. Section 62 is uh, important. Maybe should in case you are asking, if I decide not to, uh, you know, not to carry out the PIE, is there any is there any penalty that is associated with that? So now let's see what this section is saying. This section says any person who fails to comply with the provision of this decree shall be guilty of an offence under this decree, and on conviction in the case of an individual. Now it's applicable to individual, and it's also applicable to heads and corporate body. For an individual, the person is after this. The person might be convicted to pay a thousand naira fine or a five years imprisonment. But in the case of a corporate body, a firm, uh, obviously you do not ask a corporate body to give you a uh, hundred thousand naira. It's very, very easy for them to do. So what they will do is uh, a corporate body can be convicted of maybe within, okay, you still have 50,000 or maybe at most one million naira. The magnitude of the offense depends on the magnitude of the offense. So that is still under subsection three, and we have five sections. Like I said, now let us look at section 64. Section 64. Now, section 64 is talking about mandatory study activities. So, if we're talking about the mandatory study activities that is associated with uh, the EIA, we're talking about what are some of these things that. Uh, the regulatory body will look at before they will consider a project as being mandatory for an EI study. Now, let us look at it. The first one is this section has subsections for various sectorial projects. Now, for example, I have agricultural project here. What qualifies a project for an EI to be carried out on this very project? For an agricultural project, the first thing is land development scheme covering an area of 500 hectares or more. If I have a plan to set up a project that is a, an agricultural project in nature and is to cover over 500 hectares or 500 hectares of land, that makes that project have you know that makes that project to go through the EIA process. <coughs> the B part says. Agricultural pro pro uh, program necessitating the resettlement of 100 families or more. So, if the program, if the project you are set to embark on would have uh, over 100 project affected persons, that means this project will have to go through the EIP. Development of agricultural estates covering an area of over 500 hectares or more. Okay? Drainage. Drainage and uh, irrigation. It is a drainage and irrigation project. The construction of dam and the man made lake and artificial enlargement of lake with surface area of 200 hectares or more. This will require a mandatory EIA job. We also have for fishery. You intend to go into, uh, into fishing, you intend to go into fishing. So if your plan to go into fishing will require that uh, it's you are building a fish arbor, an EIA will be carried out. Or you have a, a fish arbor and you decide to expand it probably by 50%, you have to carry out an EIA for that purpose. Or you intend to build your, your, you know, your fish farm in a swamp, in a mangrove swamp uh, forest, covering about 50 hectares. An EIA will be carried out because of the sensitivity of that area. Okay, this is for industries. This is for industries, chemical industries producing the more than 100 tons per day, uh, petrochemical of all size, and then uh, for cement company, they are producing the uh, 30 tons per hour and above. Uh, you know, iron and steel. For the mining sector, if you're mining material, a new area where the mining base covers the total area in excess of 250 hectares, an EIA would be required. Then uh, what are some of these, uh, the, the mining ores, the aluminium, copper, gold, and titanium. 
all of all these things will require an EIA carried out. How we are done with the some of this uh, environmental law. And now the next thing we need to look at is uh, guidelines and standards. Guidelines and standards. Now, if I'm a regulator and uh, I have I want a desired end, I'm working with some consultants and I want a desired end from even the government. What I need to do is I have to set, I have to put a process in place to predict their action. I have to put a process in place to ensure that what they do will come out with a higher quality. And that's where the guidelines come in. A guideline is a statement by which to determine a course of action. So with a guideline, a course of action is already determined. If somebody is not uh, really knowledgeable about how you go about the EIA thing, there is a guideline already available for that very purpose. So once you go through the guideline, it will help you to know what and what you need to do. So it aims to streamline particular processes according to a set routine or sound practice. Guideline may be issued by governments or regulators to make the action of its consultants more predictable and of a higher quality. That is for guideline. Now, the next one we are going to look at now is we're looking at standards. So what do we mean when we say standards? What do we mean when we say standards? Standards are set of quality conditions that are adhered or maintained for a particular environmental component. So standard is very specific for a particular environmental component and function. And that is to tell us that uh, each each of these sectors of the economy, or uh, each of these uh, projects, developmental projects, have set standards for their operation. As we continue the discussion, I will give some examples so that we we'll know what exactly we're talking about. Because if we're going into mining, each of the activities in the mining sector, we are talking about their surface water, they have some requirements, they have some standards, they have some particular parameters in their consideration. An uh, example is the pH. <clears throat> a standard would help you to gauge, to know if the if uh, <clears throat> if your set activity, you know, is exceeding the stipulated, uh, you know, requirements by law. Now, the pH standard, the pH standard should be between six point five and seven point five, and that means if I have a company and then uh, I have a surface water close by. And constantly I discharge effluent into the surface water. And at the end of the day, I notice that uh, the pH has climbed to about 10 or something. That is to tell you that there is something wrong. Why? Because it's not falling within the stipulated standard created by the law. Yes, guidelines. <clears throat> These guidelines are specialized. They, we have, they are sectorial. We have guidelines for oil and gas. We have guidelines for infrastructure. We have guidelines for industries. We have guidelines for agriculture. We have guidelines for mining. So if we're talking about guidelines for oil and gas, it includes petroleum refinery, petrochemical industry. So if you are setting up a petrochemical industry, obviously the guideline you should be searching for is the oil and gas guideline for that very purpose. Or you're setting up uh, you know, a mining uh, facility. We need to look for the guideline that is related to the mining sector of the economy. Okay? For example, we have uh, the one of the national guidelines. We have the mining EI sectorial guideline. Now, the, the purpose of this very guideline is that uh, it is at ensuring the environmental sustainability of the mining sector through compliance with environmental impact assessment. The general purpose of all guidelines is to ensure there is compliance. The compliance applies to various mining activities, including the mining of fossil fuel, especially coal, tech, industrial minerals, rocks, kaolin, you know, bosites, and other precious metals. It, however, does not apply to the extraction of oil and gas, which has which has been addressed in the oil and gas sectorial guideline. 
So there are times that uh, if some of these guidelines might seem like it's going to be completed, it does not apply to it. Because uh, we have a uh, we have fossil fuel here, it does not mean that uh, it does not have any need to do any more with oil and gas, uh, you know, sectorial guidelines. A mining company might have uh, their diesel storage area, and you have some other details that will be spelled out in this oil and gas sectorial guideline. So if you have a mining facility, you are not to rely only on this. You also need to carry along the oil and gas sectorial guideline and other relevant guidelines that are also somehow you're not directly related to your own sector. Okay? All right. So another guideline we have in place in Nigeria, we have the National Water Guideline and Standard. Now, what's initiate, what is the purpose for this very guideline? In the view of increasing rapid and uh, emphasize the urbanization, technological exploits, and chemical pollution of the environment as affecting the quality of water resources and their ability to support life. The Federal Ministry of Environment has a mandate to restore and uh, you know, preserve the ecosystem of Nigeria to ensure compliance with existing environmental law. So in fulfillment of all of this, all of this, we have seen a whole lot of uh, developments coming up. So in view of this, there is now need for this mandate to be in place. And that is why we now have uh, we now have this national water guideline standard for various use. It's various use because it's water for you know for cooling and all of all these examples listed here. This guideline have standards for drinking water. Standards for drinking water. If your water is going to be portable, there are there are particular parameters that you'll be looking out for. So this guideline states out as it, it states all the parameters that are relevant for portable drinking water. And it also identifies all the parameters that are relevant for agricultural use. Not just identifying them, it also states, you know, the limits, the standard limit that, are, that is allotted to it. There is a what drinking water standard for livestock drinking. There is a drinking water standard for aquatic life. There is also drinking water, uh, there is also water quality standard, sorry. Not, there's also water quality standard for recreation. Let me take it again. We have water quality standard for uh, you know livestock drinking, water quality standard for aquatic life, and water quality standard for recreation. We also have now we have a water quality guideline for you know steam generator, petroleum industry, you know, all of all this. Power generating station, all of all these are all stated in the law. And now, in conclusion, we acknowledge that Nigeria has taken serious steps to develop effective environmental strategies by the promulgation of the EIB regulatory and statutory mandates, the environmental laws. Nigeria EI experts and consultants believe that the main objective of EIA is to en enhance sustainable development and to reduce environmental impact on projects and to help in decision making process. So to date, the success has been rooted in public participation and the legal regulations of the EIA. However, we still have some challenges. And some of the challenges we have some problems such as lack of general public awareness. Now, some of what we are saying today, the general public is not aware of it. The average citizen does not really know that there is a stakeholder for any project that comes into his or own community. So these are some of the setbacks that we have. So EIA practitioners need to involve, need to involve the need to urgently address these issues through uh, having a okay through you know EI practitioners needs to have a thorough knowledge on the EIA regulatory and then the statutory requirements. Thank you very much. Have a good time.